Namaste to all of you. Before I begin, let me admit the gratitude and the debt of love that I owe to Dr. Anand Reddy ji and to the Vaas Sakar family. I am in touch of Dr. Reddy for the last 10 years when I was doing research or when uh, mother made it in an excuse to invite me to Pondi through my research on Sri Arvindot Savitri. I have been helped by him, who is a living manifestation, a, an exegete and a man of knowledge on Sri Arvindot's philosophy and yoga and of course on Savitri. Thank you so much to Deep Sikha Didi also and my gratitude to Shruti Vidwaika, Dr. Shruti, uh, Shruti ji also for her sustained sacrifices and her dedication to carry forward the mother's work through Sakar there in Pondi. Dear friends and participants, those who are viewing me, the mother's last family, I welcome you. I offer my salutations to you from uh, uh, Himalayas. I am sitting near to Badrinath ji and it is always a joy to discuss Sri Aurobindo whether this or on the, that topic, three years, excuse me, I regret the interruption. Today uh, we will discuss Sri Aurobindo's importance for today's India. But before that, it is essential to understand who Sri Aurobindo really was. And it is the mother, her force and fire who could see the real image and the real aura of Sri Aurobindo. She prophetically said, what Sri Aurobindo represents in the world's history is not a teaching, not even a revelation. It is a mighty action straight from the Supreme. So this needs to be understood properly. He is not here to create mathas and ashrams and mandirs and all that. He is here to establish a new rule of divine, to bring down God on earth, to fulfill existence, to enjoy and let others enjoy, uh, celebrate the same uh, divine bliss. Three days back, we solemnized the Mahasamadhi day of Sri Aurobindo. Let us reflect on those prophetic lines that are written on his Samadhi and that reveal a lot. Those lines are mothers, our whole earth's gratitude visualized by the mother to Sri Aurobindo. In that, in that reflection, in that admission of that, she categorically says that you have willed all, you have prepared all, you have achieved all for us. Everything has been done by you. All sacrifices, every tapasya, every austerity, every Everest of understanding and spiritual realization has been submitted by you, surmounted by you. Now, what is our need? What is the work that is that today's India needs to do? That work is to understand those summits of understanding, those Mount Everest's of spiritual realization that have been scaled and established by Sri Aurobindo. My dear friends, many love their mother, many love the motherland. But when we talk about Sri Aurobindo, his love for India was boundless. It was ineffable, nearly impossible to gauze the depth of his love. Remember that beautiful letter written to his wife, Ma Marinalini Deviji. In that letter, he talks about the three manias. The first one is all my higher education, my skill, my intellectual uh, vigor, my intellectual wit, my 
excellence, my education, my higher education, my money, everything that I have belongs to the country, belongs to these countrymen. We were 30 crore at that time. So these 30 crore people are my brothers and sisters. I cannot use my resources and my money and my skill for my own sustenance or for that matter, my own family's sustenance. This belongs to the whole India, Bhavani Bharti. The second mania, according to Sri Aurobindo, was his second mania was he wanted to see God face to face. Face to face. Not chanting glibly the mantras and visiting synagogues, temples and finding him outside and never meeting him. Endless gibberish, but no solid spiritual realization of God. If he exists, I wish to see him face to face. So this is also a work of Biratma, heroic souls. God realization or spiritual adventure is not for the cowardly or the wicked. It is for Viratma, for heroic souls. And the third mania was, the third madness was, other people look and celebrate India as a piece of earth, beautiful, full of beautiful mountains, Gangetic plains, plateaus, Sundarbans, forests, flowers, sites, sceneries. But Sri Aurobindo says that he looks at India as one loves, as one looks at one's mother. There is a great difference between looking at the country as a piece of uh, forest or a dust, a piece of soil, and looking at the motherland as your own mother. Today, we need to understand this relationship, this sonship, larger sonship. Somewhere he, he used this phrase, larger sonship. Bhavani Bharati. Today's India, if recalls Sri Aurobindo's lights and if remembers this revelation, if recalls and understands the truth hidden behind these prophetic lines, our life shall surely be revolutionized. In at one place in the aphorism in thoughts and aphorisms, I'm deeply touched whenever I I go through that one aphorism, which again shows Sri Aurobindo's immense love for India. I'm reading out that aphorism, and the aphorism is. Our country is God the mother. In fact, this is 235. Aphorism number 235 in thoughts and aphorisms. Our country is God the mother. Speak not evil of her unless thou canst do it with love and tenderness. Highly touching lines. Even if you want to criticize the mother, Go, motherland. Do it with love and tenderness. Don't involve yourself in shenanigans, uh, shenanigans, underhand dealings, trickeries. Don't plot to divide the country. Don't create a rift between Hindus and Muslims, between this community and that community. Don't use and exploit the motherland for your petty and insignificant ends. If you feel that you need to slander or you need to criticize the motherland because she is Matra Devata, our country is God the mother, Matra Dev. She is not just a piece of earth, she is God the mother. So if you want to speak evil of her, preferably avoid speaking any evil or any criticism of the motherland because she is equal to your biological mother. We all know what was the reply of Lord Rama when Lakshmanji tantalizingly put the, uh, the offer before him that this, this, this land of Lanka is full of opulence. Let us settle down here. What was his proverbial and celebrated reply? Api Mai Lanka Name Lakshman Rochate Janani Janma Bhomishya Swarga Dapi 
I know this land of Lanka is full of material properties and material opulence. But mother and motherland are worse than the heaven. They are more important, more near to heart than the heaven itself. So I have to we have to return back to Ayutthaya. So this sonship, this larger sonship to the motherland, today's India needs to re-establish in their collective lives, in her collective life. If you speak not evil of her, unless thou canst do it with love and tenderness. Kabhi matra bhumi ki burai karne kabhi mauka hai, to pyaar aur najukta se wo burai karni hai. We need not to be extremely bitter when we are talking about the faults and follies and the shortcomings or the backwardness of the motherland. It still needs to be said with love and tenderness. In his wonderful and revolutionary and invocatory prophet, uh, pamphlet, Bhavani Mandir, there also Sri Aurobindo categorically says that nation or mother country is not a figure of a speech or a piece of land or some imagination of the mind. She is the mighty Shakti. She is the mighty Shakti. And now again from the Bhavani Bharti I am quoting what Sri Aurobindo's dreams and realizations and prognostications or predictions about India were. He was the only philosopher. He was the only yogi who could see the real purpose of existence of India and the real reasons behind the resurgence of India. I would like you to remind his advice which he gave to uh, in his parting speech of Bengal National College. You have to be great to make India great. You have to be rich to make India powerful and opulent. Work that she may suffer, work that she may prosper. Suffer that she may enjoy, she may rejoice. All is contained in that one advice. Today's India, today's youth need to understand are we working for only for our families or only for our uh, modern lifestyles or we are contributing something for the motherland? Are we prospering at the cost of India or because of our prosperity, mother India is also becoming prosperous? These things need to be very seriously understood in national life. For, fortunately, we have a prime minister who remembers and I would say who lives in Sri Aurobindo in his personal life. Barely two weeks back, he referred Sri Aurobindo with great veneration, with great honor and exhorted to the youth of the country that the more they will reach Sri Aurobindo, the more they will become intellectually knowledge intellectuals, knowledge aristocrats. I would say Mr. Modi is the one who has, in a way, brought Sri Aurobindo in the national discourse of today's India. And this is a need of the hour, particularly in these tempestuous times, when the tsunami of death or the horrors of pandemic are howling and roaring every side and virtually knocking at our doors. Only were safe who kept God in their hearts. We need to remember Savitri. Those who are faithful, those who have God in their hearts will be protected by God, will be protected by Sri Aurobindo. Conquer thy heart's throbs, let thy heart beat in God. Our heart beat is thudding for so many frills, so many outer things, so many useless things, spiritually at least useless things. We need to conquer the th threats of the heart beat. We need to turn our hearts and open our hearts before the mother for their spiritual help and succor because the whole world could take refuge in her single heart. She's having a Himalayan a mammoth heart. Her heart and Mahayogi's hand, his spiritual help, they, they, his outstretched hand of grace can protect not only India, not only this small planet, but the whole macrocosm. 
I endorse the views of Mr. Anmol Jain three, four days back when he admitted that it is even calling Sri Aurobindo an avatar is a very, very common word. The compassion, the karuna, the love, the empathy that mother and Sri Aurobindo has for the world, for the humanity is boundless and cannot simply be understood through our small and petty minds. My dear brothers and sisters, Sri Aurobindo knew and visualized the dream of free India. He was the one who could see why India is getting liberated. To help the wicked, to help the weak, to challenge the wicked, to become the spiritual protector of the world, to become Vishwaguru. Not in getting involved in expansionism or imperialism or you know the superpowers as the superpowers of yesterday and today are doing. India is emerging for the wider emergence of this world. India is touching new shores of opulence in order to make this world enjoy in the opulence of real opulence of spirituality and materiality also. So he was very sure that India cannot perish. He was very sure that divine hand is always behind, uh, behind India. India is being protected and sustained and sublimated by the divine hand. No political power, uh, party, no political movement. Apparent, apparently it may seem that uh, uh, party, specific party liberated the country, but they were all the puppets. The secret and clandestine hand of God was behind that. India liberated, got liberated and is emerging on world arena with the flying colors, adding new feathers, new wings in the feather every day because it's God's will. And what is the mission of India? I'm recalling, I'm reciting the prophetic lines of Sri Aurobindo. India cannot perish. Our race cannot become extinct. Out of 46 civilizations, only ours is alive. Kuch baat hai ki hasti mitti nahi hamari. Wo kuch baat that has never been discussed. What is that special thing which is, which is, uh, which is the cause of perennial survival of this industrial civilization? That kuch baat is spirituality. The best and the deepest Devotional poetry has been written in India in the most tempestuous time of Mughal age. The Bhakti Kaal, I am referring to Bhakti Kaal. This world has, this country has not seen a second Tulsidas, a second Kavir, a second Rasthan, second Mira. The best spiritual and deepest touching the course of the heart. That kind of spiritual sublime poetry written during the most tempestuous times. So kuch pe people who were lost, who were unhappy, who were uh, feeling helplessness, they were uplifted by the poets. If monarchs were getting defeated, poets took the front sheet. They became the rulers, the intellectual or the emotional rulers, rulers of the country. The agony uncles and agony aunts, if I can use the term loosely. That kuch baat, that specific thing is our spirituality. Spirituality, according to Sri Aurobindo, is the master key of Indian mind. Sense of the infinite is native to it. You cannot understand India if you are not spiritual or if you do not see India or view India or reflect on India through a spiritual standpoint. It has been essentially the land of Sastra and Dharma, the land of spirituality, the land where God chose to come down. In one of his beautiful speeches, perhaps the Jhali Kati speech, he says that we are no ordinary race. Our glorious history is as old as the mountains and seas. We are the people with whom God chose to manifest himself. Not avatars, God himself. Our race cannot extinct because among all the divisions of mankind, 
among all the divisions of mankind it is india that is reserved it is it is to india that is reserved the highest and the most splendid destiny mind the words of sri arbindo for india out of all these seven continents out of or 200 odd countries it is to india that the more highest and the most splendid destiny has been reserved what can be the highest and most splendid destiny to become the spiritual conscience keeper of the world to become the guru of the world the guide of the world the mentor of humbling and staggering humanity this special splendid destiny has been reserved for india i'm going further the most essential for the future of human race india is most essential for the future of the entire human race it is her mission to purge barbarism out of humanity or and in bracket he has written malichahood a person or a country or a people having no civilization having no cultural eth ethos having no divine or godly tendency is malich is dashu so all those marauders all those attackers who crossed karakoram who entered india who looted plundered rapined raped the country and returned with thousands and tons of uh, wealth and opulence they are all and they were all malicha and malicha who never dies look at what is happening between azerbaijan and armenia look at what is happening on the borders look at what is happening through the isis the isis are the malicha of this time all human pettiness all human ugliness all mudsling that one country is throwing on his neighbor or other country is a sign of malichahood so the mission of india to aryanize the world puri duniya ko arya jati mein badal dena this is the mission of india but he he acts in order to do that in order to do to aryanize the whole world and in order to achieve that target india needs to reorganize reorganize herself what can a pauper give to others only a king becomes a great donor a great dani we have become almost spiritually pauper so in a pauper in the in that indigence we cannot give others first we need to establish that aryahood in our collective life by becoming living and glaring examples of aryatva that is the priority that is the foremost need of today's india and that is why in his beautiful essay the ideal of karma yogin he categorically writes he did not want americans to become indian he did not wants to copy to become japanese or he is not expecting from chinese or japanese to emulate indian example he is exhorting to the youth of india the future builders of humanity that become the indian first his masterful call his highly emotive and spiritual and uh, intellectual call to the youth of india be the indian first it is the it is only the indian who can dare everything who can sacrifice everything who can achieve everything we need to retrieve recover sri arbindo has beautifully used the word recover he did not say lost recover the aryan life the aryan discipline the aryan character recover that you have lost you have that has been lost he did not used finished because our country our spiritual patrimony has never got finished oh it was lost in the dust in the dollar of you know slavery and thousand years suppression and oppression it was somewhere somewhere lost in the dusty corners of the recesses of the country's mind but it could still retrieved and that's why shri arbindo said recover the aryan character the aryan life the aryan discipline
the Aryan character. Recover the patrimony of your forefathers. The real patrimony is not a big palatial house or a huge bank balance. No, materiality can never be the real patrimony. The real patrimony is the, the beautiful legacy of thoughts that our forefathers had and left for us. Real patrimony is all the works of the mother and Sri Aurobindo. Real patrimony is the Aryan character, the, uh, all the glorious Upanishads, the Puranas, the Shastras, the Mahakabhyas, the Aranaks, the Upanishads. This is the real patrimony. The legacy of thought, the legacy of conduct and character, only this can be real patrimony. So Sri Aurobindo is exhorting to the youth of the country. Without becoming Indian in thought, in mind and character, in life, without establishing that Indianhood, that Aryatva in our collective life, we can never teach anything to the world. So he was very systematical in his teachings. Without having realized that personal Aryahood in our collective life, India can never teach any other country that be like us. No. So this was his call. And then he's exhorting that impossibility and death will vanish from your dictionaries. If once this Aryahood, this glorious legacy of Indian forefathers has established and realized in, again in the collective lifeblood of the country, the country was naturally uh, paved the way for others and will naturally summit all barriers and will naturally establish itself on the position of Vishwaguru. Simply uttering and exhorting and simply writing and simply boastfully, uh, you know, pontificatingly saying that we are Vishwaguru, we are Vishwaguru, but having doing nothing for achieving or uh, realizing that Vishwaguru, it's nothing but a brag, a boastful talk. If we are not living Aryatva, we have no right to speak about Aryatva. This is what Sri Aurobindo wanted from us. He wanted to begin from, and this is the ideal of Sri Aurobindo society also. It is not enough to know. It is not enough to live. One has to be the living example. One has to be, one has to achieve that for good. You need not to be, to, be, to express that you are this your very presence must be a testimony of your ideals. And that's why the mother says, to be, that is perfect. And that's why Sri Aurobindo says, one man's perfection still can save the world. Because that one man's perfection will be testimony for others. They will see him and they will become like him. As the way has been put before us by Sri Aurobindo. So when our country got liberated, Sri Aurobindo wrote an essay and he categorically said that it would be an irony of fate if India develops herself only on the military line, militarily line, only becomes an spiritual power, only becomes an uncle same as America and Russia became later on. It will be a tragedy. India's real force, real message, real patrimony, real character is spirituality and only and only spirituality. I am quoting the Mahayogi's words and you will definitely enjoy those words and they will be echoed and re-echoed in the recesses of your mind. That why he want, what he wanted India like. Deeper issues for India. He talks about there are deeper issues for India. Even issue of money and matter is not deeper. Even issue of becoming a military superpower is not deeper. Even becoming a great expansionist force like China is not deeper. There are deeper issues for India. So what are those deeper issues which a renegatant India needs to follow and inculcate in the personal and collective life? I am quoting Sri Arvind. There are deeper issues for India herself. Since by following certain tempting directions, you know, uh, dozens of countries and more than that were becoming free in, tho in those times. And the whole 20th century, in fact, by the end of 19th century, there were only three fully liberated countries in the Asia. 
सो ट्वेंटी सेंचुरी कैन बी कॉल्ड सेंचुरी ऑफ कंट्रीज फ्रीडम्स अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड एंड डेमोक्रेसी वॉज इंट्रोड्यूस्ड एवरीवेयर इन दैट प्रीवियस सेंचुरी सो न्यू कंट्रीज न्यू वेज न्यू विजन न्यू आइडियोलॉजीज सोशलिज्म कैपिटलिज्म ऑल दैट सो श्री अरिंदो इंडिकेटिंग क्लियरली ऑन दैट फॉलोइंग सम टेम्पटिंग डायरेक्शन सम टेंटिलाइजिंग डायरेक्शन बाई फॉलोइंग सर्टेन टेम्पटिंग डायरेक्शन शी मे कंसीबेबली बिकम ए नेशन लाइक मेनी अदर्स इवॉल्विंग एन ऑपुलेंट इंडस्ट्री यू नो uh and commerce a powerful organization of social and political life intense military strength practicing power politics with high degree of success this all can happen india can become following those tempting directions un lubhavne raston par ja kar we we could have become a military power or an economic super power or an uncle sam or playing power politics between countries and subduing the wicked making other nations banana republic and establishing our so called political superiority subduing other nations capturing their territory as our northern never is doing and attracting much shame across the world we could all become like that but sri arbindo's caution is in apparently magnificent progression for pitting its swadharma and losing its soul but if india gets involved in all these shenanigans all these tempting directions india will lose its swadharma it will lose her soul and what a great loss that would be what have he lost what has usne kya paya jisne is jisne khud ko khoya खुद को खोके हम क्या पाएंगे वी वॉट विल वी गेन सो वी शुड नॉट लूज टच विद अवर स्वधर्मा अवर स्वभाव एंड वॉट इज अवर स्वधर्म एंड वॉट इज अवर स्वभाव एंड वॉट हैज बीन इटर्नली अवर मैसेज वी हैव ऑलवेज टेकन दिस वर्ल्ड एज अवर फैमिली वी हैव ऑलवेज टीचर अवर नेवर हाउ सो अवर लॉन्ग ही मे बी एज अवर ब्रेथरन एज अवर ब्रदर एज वन अमंग अस it is only is knees highly awakened and sublime moments that the rishid could utter the words ki may we see everyone as friend or mata bhumi putro aham prithibya or for that matter vasudhaiva kutumbakam the whole world is my family and i object to this line the whole brahmand is our family not only this vasudha this this kind of spiritual sublimity spiritual messages have uh, went f- uh, from uh, india india was known for these things these sublime things we have always acted as protectors and guide for the world so we need not to lose our swadharma and then his sri arbindo is concluding it would be a tragic irony of fate it would be a tragic irony of fate if india were to throw away her spiritual heritage throw away her spiritual heritage at the very moment when in the rest of the world there is more and more it turning towards her spiritual help and saving light you must keep the appeal that vivekananda aroused in the uh, in the um, i mean panic ridden minds and hearts of the americans the way vivekananda ji presented indian spirituality and indian vision and indian ethos and indian religious traditions before a western crowd of master nations he is indicating on all those things there is a renewed vigor there is a renewed inquisitiveness in the mind of the west in rest of the world rest of the world is looking at india for her spiritual light and help for saving light and india throwing away that glorious patrimony and adopting the same uh, societal paths of matter materialism uh, so called socialism capitalism which are in a way ban for the humanity much credit goes to our blind materialism our uh, mindless consumerism the way we are facing the problem today in the form of diseases or apocalyptic pandemic like corona so this is one of the reserves for shri arbindo uh, ignoring shri arbindo 
my dear brother and sisters now one more interesting thing we many people confuse the teaching and the path shri arbindu has what is the message of shri arbindu what is the vision of shri arbindu what is the yoga sadhana paddhati of shri arbindu but in a letter which was written to motilal roy he wrote dozens of letter which are uh, compiled in uh, autobiographical notes to motilal roy who was a great help for him in his initial days of escape or the following the divine order in the chandan nagar so he writes to motilal roy you must understand that my mission is not to create mat ascetics and sanyasis i do not wish to create a crop of sanyasis or you know tuft um uh, holding people and all that i do not want to create a crop of sanyasis bairagis ascetics this is not my mission but to call back to the souls of the strong mind this word the strong spirituality needs bold and strong people cowardly people timid people are needed nowhere least of all in the path of spirituality but what is the mission of shri arbindo to call back on the to the souls of the strong to the life to the leela of krishna and kali those who are very on i hope most of the viewers are familiar with the works of shri arbindo and mother how intimate is the relationship of krishna and kali how necessary how ecstatic is the leela of krishna and kali this whole world is he and she shia ram you know the thing like that this whole world is only he and she so i want to invite to call back the souls of the strong for the leela of krishna and kali it is a challenge before us to qualify on this touchstone on this crucible of shri arbind are we fit are we qualified for that path are we are we capable are we pure enough to become the playmates of shri arbind and the mother this is the challenge before us and he does not need they do not need wickedly they do not need cowards because this earth needs viratma heroic souls i am reminded of three lines of savitri earth is the chosen place of the mightiest souls earth is the heroic spirits battlefield the forge where the arch mission has shaped arch mission shapes its dreams this is the world where god materializes forges his dreams by inviting and by setting to action the viratma the heroic souls at one place in savitri shri arbindo also says god in world's life fulfills the dream god in man's life works out the man in the world's life works out the dreams of god 479 last line man in the world's life fulfills the dreams of god so viratmao ki zarurat hai we need heroic souls we need brave souls the path of spirituality or yoga is not for those who seek primrose path everywhere those who want shortcuts those who wants bypasses sorry friends this is not for this path is not for those a stark must he be and a kinsman to danger remember his poem the invitation what are the conditions a stark must he be and a kinsman to danger shirmdo is calling the mother is calling us for spiritual adventures where anything can happen because adventures includes hazards including deaths your material death so he is inviting who will come with me who will climb with me this is an invitation not to his family but to the whole world to the india in general but the condition is stark must he be a kinsman to danger he must be familiar with the hazards with dangers with difficulties with foibles with failures with frustrations he must be a heroic soul a viratma so sri arbindo's mission is not to create or establish mat missions sanyasi 
Bairagi and escape from life, those who love escape from life, no, his, his work, his mission is to call back into life the souls of the strong for the play. For, play is a very loose word for Leela. For, that's why Sri Aurobindo has used the original word Leela of Krishna and Kali. Every, the, the concluding words are more important. Every ascetic movement in, since the time of Buddha has left India weaker and for a very obvious reason. Since the time of Buddha, every religious movement that occurred in India left the national life weaker and for a very obvious reason. So if Buddhas are escaping life, who will change the world? If the best souls are being taken away from the life of a nation, who will protect others? Who will tell that how much spiritual ananda is essential for life? If only control of mind is yoga, then what is this vast world? So that's why Sri Aurobindo, because for him nothing is beyond the periphery of yoga. That's why in that first chapter, in the last line of his first chapter of the synthesis of yoga, he gives us perhaps the most radical definition of yoga. That all life is yoga. No activity, all life is yoga. Every place is the field of yoga. Yoga bhumi, everywhere. Conditions are suitable. You can become a yogi everywhere. All life is yoga. So he categorically destroys the division between sansar and sannyas, between maya and divine, because he talks about divine maya. So for him, everything is a manifestation of yoga. His laughter of beauty breaks out in green trees. His moments of beauty triumph in a flower. The blue seas chant, the rivulets wandering voice, are murmurs falling from the eternal's heart. This world is God fulfilled in outwardness. If we can't see God in nature, we can't see him at all everywhere, anywhere. If you can't see God in a smiling child or a laughing woman or in a morning dawn or a, sing, a bird singing on a nearby bough, we can never meet God. Because again in Savitri on page 37 he says, God fulfilled in nature, nature completed in God or something like that. God and nature are intimately, inextricably linked. So the beginning to see God should be from the nature itself. His laughter of beauty breaks out in green trees. His moments of beauty triumph in a flower. The blue seas chant, the rivulets wandering voice are murmurs falling from the eternal's harp. This world is God fulfilled in outwardness. So where to escape and what to escape from? There is every place is God's place. Everywhere is Leela of Krishna. If you are not a yogi in a sannyasi, you will be entrapped in the jungle. And if you are a yogi, a perfect sannyasin, a real inner ascetic, you will enjoy yoga maya, you will enjoy the fruits of spirituality even in Chavadi Bajar or Chandni Chow. Because the whole Bajar is in your mind. The enticements, the, the induces, everything is there. The snares are there. So his, his mission is to invite, to call the souls of the brave into the collective life of India or uh, for the collective work of the mother. So Sri Aurobindo is criticizing Buddhahood. He is criticizing, commenting the Indian tendency of escaping or taking away the best and the most enlightened minds of, from collective life and uh, leaving the nation wicked, weak, decimated, dead, moribund. You cannot take away best souls and yet leave life stronger and greater. This logic is very clear. If Buddhas leave the society, who will enlighten it? If the most awakened souls leave the society, remain in recluse as recluse in some seclusion, who will take up the burning issues of the society? So if Buddhahood, if Prabodhan, 
if enlightenment is a very special thing, if spirituality is the best thing that we can have in our life, if spirituality is really the work of works, the acceptable sacrifice, then it must be for everybody, all and sundry. We cannot escape, we cannot make it an elitist thing in a supermarket. And unfortunately, in the current day India, some supermarket gurus are there. Mukti, Moksha, Kundali, Jagran, everything is on sale with 40, 50, 60 percent discount. And as dummy souls, duffer souls are everywhere, people are getting snared and losing everything. Kundali Jagran is not a matter of half an hour. It is not even a matter of one life. Self-realization is not even a matter of one life. It is only grace and kripa and continued and sustained spiritual ardor that one can, uh, uh, one can aspire for that thing and one can receive the... Even to have the real gurus, real masters are also a great good fortune. So... What is Sri Aurobindo's teaching? Some people feel that it is very difficult to understand Sri Aurobindo. His yoga sadhana, his, his, his Purun yoga, it is very difficult to understand. In just two lines, in fact the line is one, the sentence has been broken into two. He reveals before us his all message. Renunciation of ego and acceptance of God in life is the only yoga I teach. Renunciation of ego. We do not need to leave the world. We need to leave ego. Renunciation of ego and on the other hand, acceptance. The opposite word. Acceptance of God in life. Not God away from society. Not God away from life. Not God in jungles. God in life as a whole is the only yoga I teach. No other renunciation. My disciple, my follower, those who profess that they are children of the mother and Sri Aurobindo, need to follow these two lines. By following the message of this one line, we can fully inculcate and imbibe Sri Aurobindo in our lives. Renunciation of ego and acceptance of God in life is the only yoga I teach. And that's why he said, all life is yoga. So with four lines from Savitri, for the youth of India, he had definitely transforming messages, remarkable messages. I would just quote one more reference. I am particularly fond of his essays, his essay on original thinking. There are so many inputs in that essay, so much spiritual light. And that essay is directly addressed to the youth of India, the nation builders, the builders of new humanity. And in that essay, Sri Aurobindo says, if India is to survive, our first necessity, if India is to survive and do her appointed task in the world, appointed task, Bharat ke zimme jo kaam diya gaya hai, ki tumne dunia ka guru banna hai. You have to aryanize the world. Remember the tagline, remember the bottom line, remember this uh, uh, phrase, appointed task. If the, our first necessity, if India is to survive and do her appointed work in the world, is that the youth of India should learn to think. In one of his aphorisms, Sri Aurobindo says, rather hang thyself than become then belong to the horde of blind imitators. And in the same essay, he, he, he says that our business as original thinkers is to reject everything and accept nothing. Why to accept anything blindly? But he cautions that we must reject things because we have understood, not because we have failed to understand. Remarkable, remarkable light. So the first business, the, the tag, the label that often is uh, uh, given to Indian youths or Indians as a whole is that they are imitators. Their Bollywood is nothing but a blind, a, a, a third-rate copy of Hollywood. Our authors are often accused, are accused of 
plagiarism we have stopped thinking originally we have stopped producing original thinkers and when a country stops thinking it dies because i think therefore i am you may be uh, you may, you may be rem remembering descartes the first necessity of india is the youth of india should learn to think but how to think he is expressing further explaining further to think on all subjects to think independently it is also necessary a thought that is bound can never be a, an original thought we need to think independently and what he means independently without any preconditions without any prejudices without any fore conclusion that is independent thinking without any narrowness of one's own self without any ideological biases current india is divided broadly in two kinds indian right and indian left there is no indian sector either we belong to arnab goswami or belong to that boastful ravis kind of things indian right indian left where is the indian center we have lost independent thinkers we 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 are blind of our own uh, you know ideologies and ideological biases so shri arbindo exhorts and cautions and categorically says that we need to think independently fruitfully there must be some conclusion of the thinking you cannot say that uh, yes yes i am thinking for 20 years and after 20 years again when your findings are inquired you you can you are saying that uh, yes yes i am thinking no this is not going to be accepted the thinking must be fruitfully meaningful going to the heart of things how should one think one should go to the heart of things hriday guhyam mein jaakar the real core of existence one should touch that our thinking our sublimated thinking should have that potential going to the heart of things not stopped by their surface free of prejudice pre prejudgment prejudgment sharing sophism sharing sophism and prejudice ascender as with the sharp sword smiting down obscurity obscurantism of all kinds as with the mace of bhima all kinds of sophism kutark all kinds of narrowness all kinds of obscurantism what we call in the avsarvad mauka parasti in urdu that should be smitten smitten down as with the mace of bhima so dear friends we need to become indian we need to understand shri arbindo properly we need to become arya putri in the real sense of the word we need to imbibe the essence of his essays his lights his books and there is no doubt that today's india will emerge stronger better materially culturally spirituality from all sides we will definitely be a real vibrant new india new india was one of the focuses or focal points shri arbindo mentioned so with the uh, reciting four lines from savitri which i am of extremely fond of i will conclude my words when in the 11th cant uh, in the 11th book god directly addresses savitri o sun world thou shalt raise the earth soul to light and bring down god into the lives of men earth shall be my work chamber and my house not india earth entire earth earth shall be my work chamber and my house my garden of life to plant a seed divine so this is the work that we have before us by becoming living manifestations of shri arvindo's work and sadhana by becoming living examples of shri arvindo's teachings we can be those divine seeds a means for express, expressing and expanding the sadhana the spiritual fragrance of shri arvindo and the mother lot of glories at the divine feet of the mother and shri arvindo thank you so much good night thank you sakar once more thank you shruti ji and dr ananda reddy and their laborious team i finish